Bazelon is a journalist, lawyer, and one of America's most incisive analysts of the criminal justice system. As a New York Times Magazine staff writer, she has covered a variety of legal affairs, including the Supreme Court, but has focused recently on the power of prosecutors to send more and more people to prison. That's the subject of her new book, Charged, the New Movement to Transform American Prosecution and End Mass Incarceration. Emily Bazelon, thank you very much for being here as part of CrossCut Now. Thanks so much for having me. It's a pleasure. How did you um, come to take on this subject? Is it, a, is it a personal subject to you? It's a personal subject to me in that I'm a lawyer by training, and I've written about the criminal justice system for years. And I had noticed the power of prosecutors in my reporting for a long time. And then some different academics started writing about how much power prosecutors have and really showing us empirically how that works, in particular how the degree of felony charging has doubled by prosecutors. So, you know, prosecutors get to decide what criminal charges to bring. 30 years ago, they were half as likely to bring felony charges, the most serious kind, as they are now. And so that fact helped push me into writing this book because it was a kind of empirical support for things that I've observed in my reporting. I think um, many of us think that there's an equal application of the law, that there is, I think you mentioned a triangle of how the, the system is supposed to work, how it's set up to work. And your whole book is about showing how unfair the system is showing that there's a race and in the pressure to win that it's almost like a game. Yeah, so I think the classic image of the American criminal justice system is a triangle where the defense lawyer and the prosecutor are on an equal playing field down here. They're supposed to have the same kind of bargaining power. And then the judge is at the top of the triangle as the neutral referee, the person who's making the decisions whose job it is to be fair and even-handed. What's actually happened over the last 40 years is that the prosecutor has replaced the judge as the key decision maker in many ways. And this has to do a lot with mandatory sentences. Once you're a prosecutor who can bring a charge with a mandatory sentence, the punishment is effectively baked into the charge and into the plea bargain that you offer. Charging and plea bargaining are parts of the process that don't really involve judges. They involve prosecutors. And so without really talking about it or surfacing it, we transfer the discretion that judges used to have onto prosecutors. And prosecutors are not neutral referees. As you just said, one of their most important goals is to win cases. They're also obligated to do justice, but this drive to win cases changes what it means to have them at the top of the triangle. So, do, but don't things like plea bargainings help make the system more efficient? Absolutely, plea bargaining keeps the wheels of the system turning but at a cost. It means that people are not going to trial. We're at a point in a lot of state court systems where 97, 98% of convictions happen through plea bargains. It's at a trial that someone gets to test the state's evidence against them and that we find out if the police are doing their jobs properly, if there's been an illegal arrest, for example. So when everything happens through plea bargainings, these very important checks on state power disappear. And also, plea bargaining happens in secret. It's not not in open court. There's no record of the decisions that a prosecutor makes. It's bargaining and haggling out in the hallway or on the phone. That's not how our system was designed to work. I think the thing that really stands out too in terms of how plea bargainings work is this notion of how defendants are encouraged to take the plea bargain because if you don't you end up going to trial then your sentence could actually be worse. Yeah, so this is what's known as the trial penalty. One way that prosecutors induce people to plea bargain in order to keep the system moving efficiently is by saying, well, look, if you challenge us and want to take your case to trial, the charges are going to be heavier. The potential punishment you'll face will be higher. And so there's this reverse incentive, this kind of perverse incentive going on where you're supposed to have a constitutional right to a jury before your, your peers. It's right there in the Sixth Amendment. But if you try to exercise your right to a trial, you're gonna be taking a huge gamble. You could end up with a much higher punishment than you would if you just took the plea bargain. And that turns going to trial into a huge roll of the dice for defendants, and almost no one is willing to take that that risk, even if people are innocent, they sometimes plead guilty. We know that because 18% of the exonerations in this country have been people who pled guilty. The other thing you raise uh, is a look at, you examine closely the issue of bail. 
and what is wrong with the way we operate. And you, I wanted to hear a little bit more about what's happening in places like Kentucky. Right, so learning about bail just frankly blew my mind as a reporter. I thought that the reason we have money bail in this country was that it was necessary, that you have to have people put money down in order to make sure they'll come back to court. They have skin in the game, they'll come back, that's how it needs to work. It turns out that's not true. And we know that because in places like Kentucky and Washington, D.C., the system has operated without money bail for decades. And you know what? Almost everybody comes back to court anyway. So the way it works is you promise to come back to court, the court system sends you notices, reminders of when you're supposed to show up, and sometimes they connect you with support services. And that's enough. Almost everybody comes back to court because having a warrant out for your arrest is a big deal, and people understand that. They don't have to put money down. And yet, our cash bail system that operates everywhere else means that a lot of why you stay in jail or get out before your trial has to do with whether you can afford to pay bail. In other words, it's prejudiced against poor people. What are the numbers that we need to keep in mind when you look at the, the criminal justice system? Sure. So in the 1970s, the United States had the same incarceration rate as Scandinavia. We had now have five times the number of prisoners that we had then, or over two million. They've stayed the same. We have more people in jail and prison in this country than they do in Russia or in China, in any country in Europe. We're way above everyone else. And we also have about 10 million people every year who churn through our jails. These are relatively short stays, but they really mess with people's lives. You know, going to jail, you can lose your housing, um, your job, sometimes your kids. So we have this just enormous system. It has ballooned far beyond what other countries, um, what other countries do. The two characters that you profile in your book, can you tell me a little bit about why you chose who you chose and what they revealed to you in your reporting? Yeah, I wanted to write about two hard cases, cases that would really push my readers to think about the choices we make. In other words, I think at this point a lot of people can see that it doesn't make sense to lock up a kid for smoking some pot, but I wrote about two people charged with violent crimes. And I wanted also to write about two different kinds of prosecutors. So the, first story, so the first story in my book is about a girl named Nora Jackson who gets charged with murder when she's 18 by a very traditional law and order prosecutor who insists on prosecuting Nora even though this is a murder case with a lot of DNA evidence and the DNA points away from Nora. So that's the first case. The second case is very different. It's about a young 20-year-old kid in Brooklyn who's facing prison for carrying a gun. In New York, that's a serious violent felony. But he is being prosecuted by Eric Gonzalez, the newly elected district attorney in Brooklyn, who's trying to figure out how to give second chances even to people who are facing violent felonies. That's very unusual. And so I was able to follow Kevin through what's called a diversion program. He pled guilty, he was facing prison time, but in the meantime, he had a year of working with a social worker to show that he could get his life together. And if he succeeded, then he wouldn't have to go to prison. So my um, question was, is he gonna make it? Those kinds of diversion programs, how prevalent are they? Are you, are, is there momentum for more and more courts to look at what's happening in New York? There is some momentum, yes. I mean, we really have this amazing window of opportunity for criminal justice reform right now. And it's coming about for a few reasons. You know, one is this huge ballooning system costs an enormous amount of money. And so there are a lot of people, including fiscal conservatives and libertarians, who are just concerned about how huge this machine of punishment is that we've built. That's creating some momentum for political change. And then the Black Lives Matter movement, which really started out as a protest against the police, realized that the local office of district attorney or state's attorney, that's something that is really up to local voters. You can change who sits in that office with a relatively small number of people who are mobilized. And so the Black Lives Matter movement, civil rights groups, other community organizers, in a lot of cities in America, they have figured out how to get the people who are the most impacted by criminal justice, which is often communities of color and low-income people, how to get those people to the polls to elect a new kind of DA. And that's creating a window of opportunity for reducing mass incarceration, maybe even dramatically. What happens if nothing changes? 
If nothing changes, we will be, continue to be a country in which there is an incredible level of overpunishment that costs huge amounts of money and causes a lot of harm, um, especially in poor communities where there are so many people with criminal records who have trouble getting jobs, whose lives are derailed by a system that is just operating far, far beyond what's necessary to prevent crime. How should we treat people who are guilty of violent crime be treated? You know, some people who are guilty of violent crime need to be separated from the rest of society. The question is, while they're in prison, what should happen to them? Do we want to think of prison as a place that just purely exists to punish people in the harshest way possible? Or do we want to imagine prison as also a place that prepares them to come back? Because almost everybody comes back to the community when they're released from prison. And right now, we're doing things like cutting education programs in prison, making them punitive and harsh, rather than thinking about what it takes to make someone into a successful citizen when they return. So I think that's one of the questions, not do we let everybody out, but when they're inside locked up, how do we get them to be people who come out and are productive and help make the community safer instead of more dangerous? As a journalist, I would imagine a lot of people often ask you for advice. And so I would wonder if a black or brown person came to you and said, look, I'm about to enter into the system, what should I be worried about? I think black and brown people have to be worried about racial, discrimina racial discrimination and disparity because the system is riddled with that. Mostly you just want to have a good lawyer and you want to make sure not to give up more information than you have to along the way. Um, but sometimes, often, people of all colors are faced with really difficult decisions about whether to take a plea bargain right. and plead guilty to a crime and what kinds of consequences are going to come from that. And that is just a deeply difficult question. And when you're charged with the crime, usually you're not someone who's been through this a lot of times before. So the lawyers, the judge, they're repeat players. But you're sitting there with this very difficult choice to make, not necessarily knowing who to trust. That is a very hard moment for people. What do you want people to take away? Almost half of people, according to surveys, don't know that they have the power to elect their local prosecutor, their DA, their state's attorney, their county attorney. Whatever that office is called, in almost all states, their power is our power. We, the people, elect that person. I just want people to know they have this power to elect their chief prosecutor, and they should pay attention to that office the way we pay attention to the person who's mayor. This is a person who makes a tremendous impact on the lives of the people who are neighbors. And so we should care about who's in that office and think about whether that person reflects our values.